He says that the Congress has the exclusive power under the Constitution to sort of police the qualifications of its members. That's Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution. And he says that the North Carolina law uh, usurps the House's exclusive uh, uh, right to judge his qualifications. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, February 18th, 2022. Madison Cawthorn is a Republican congressman from North Carolina. His candidacy for re-election is the subject of challenge under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. You remember Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. That's the part that says that people who engage in insurrection are disqualified from holding future office under the Constitution. Roger Parloff, who has not been disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, has written a lengthy article on the Cawthorn case entitled, Can Madison Cawthorn be blocked from the North Carolina ballot as an insurrectionist? He joined me in the virtual jungle studio to discuss the various ins and outs of this case. What constitutes an insurrection for purposes of the section? What did Madison Cawthorn do? Why is he, of all members of Congress, the one who is being subjected to this challenge? And who gets to decide who gets disqualified? It's the Lawfare Podcast, February 18th, Madison Cawthorn and the 14th Amendment. Roger, who is Madison Cawthorn and why are we talking about him? He's a representative member of Congress from North Carolina, from the 11th Congressional District at the moment. And uh, he uh, has been challenged in January. uh, A voter challenge was mounted. He's trying to run for re-election. And a group of voters are trying to keep him off the ballot on the grounds that he was, in essence, too supportive. He is allegedly engaged in insurrection by uh, his actions prior to January 6th. They want to bar him under the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which, uh, as you know, uh, uh, bars uh, people who, well, it's a complex uh, section, but basically it was intended to bar certain people who had participated uh, in the Confederacy from uh, running for office again afterwards. And uh, it is broad enough to uh, uh, its terms, uh, our perspective, they uh, still apply. So if people have engaged in insurrection and or rebellion, uh, they can be barred from office if other criteria are met. So people may remember the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment from the time of the insurrection itself when there was a question of whether it should be applied to Donald Trump uh, as a means of future disqualification from office. But I suspect a lot of people will have forgotten that it potentially by its terms applies as well to members of Congress. So I, I think there's like eight or 10 separate questions that we need to talk about to think about this problem comprehensively. So let's start with just the text of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Whom does it disqualify from what sort of office and under what sort of circumstances? It's a a gnarly provision, and uh, here is how it reads in its entirety. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged 
in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. So there's a lot there. In essence, what it does, what it certainly does, is if you have held a certain number, a certain list of offices that required you to take an oath to uphold the Constitution, and then you engaged in rebellion or insurrection, then you are barred from holding another list, a slightly different list of offices. But it's pretty clear uh, that it does apply to it, to people that were members of Congress and uh, want to be members of Congress. And um, uh, Cawthorn did, uh, was sworn in on January 3rd of uh, 2021, three days before the insurrection. So he does, you know, he comes within the ambit of the section. He, he has an oath, his oath triggers the section assuming that he later engaged in insurrection. It's a little more difficult with even the president of the United States. It's not 100% clear that this talks about the president. It would be weird. Most people think it must, whether that's a federal officer or not can be disputed. But um, that's why there's one difference there with with the Trump uh, situation. All right. So let's talk about the specific questions that this raises vis-a-vis Madison Cawthorn. As you point out, there's no question that he held an office and had taken an oath. Uh, So that part is easy. But let's start with the question of how this is being challenged. One question this whole thing begs is who gets to decide if you've been an insurrectionist? And the petitioners here are petitioning, who are they asking to disqualify him? And uh, why Madison Cawthorn, as opposed to all the other members of Congress who arguably supported the insurrectionists? Yeah, I think the short answer is that the fact that Cawthorn would be the first person challenged is a surprise. I think most people would have guessed maybe Mo Brooks of Alabama, Paul Gosar of Arizona. There's some other people that people have scrutinized, Andy Biggs. But what we're seeing is that there is an unusual apparatus in North Carolina for challenging primary candidates, for challenging their right to appear on the ballot. And it's remarkably favorable to the challenger. There's a very low bar and and this is a common procedure, uh, you know, uh, across the country, there are ordinarily you are allowed, somebody is allowed to challenge the quali- basic qualifications of people that want to put their name on the ballot. Are they really the right age? Are they old enough? Do they live in this district? You know, these are relatively easy things and, and appropriate. But here the argument is, well, he's disqualified under Section 3. So they want the same sort of adjudication of that. And North Carolina really accommodates that. All you need to show is a reasonable suspicion or belief that the person is not qualified and the burden switches to the uh, candidate to prove that he is qualified. And then uh, you actually get uh, the right to discovery. You can apparently depose the candidate. You can subpoena documents from him. So it's really a remarkable statute. And I think that's why Cawthorn is the first. I did not find a comparable statute in Alabama, for instance, at least not at the primary stage. So uh, I think that's why he's first. So it's fair to say that he is not the subject of this litigation because his conduct was especially egregious among members. Is that fair? That's my surmise. Obviously, the challengers don't (laughs) acknowledge that, but uh, that's my uh, surmise about why he's first, yeah. So what did he do? What do we know? What are the allegations about what Madison Cawthorn did that 
uh, allegedly constitutes insurrection? Well, he certainly was one of the people that propagated false election fraud accusations. He uh, was apparently, allegedly, one of the people that coordinated with Stop the Steal organizers, at least that's been reported. And he did speak at the Ellipse, along with uh, Trump and Mo Brooks and, and Giuliani, right before the violence. Frankly, his remarks were not, in my view, as fiery as some of the others. They weren't great, but they, they weren't as fiery. And then after the event, he uh, disavowed the violence, uh, said it was disgusting, but he, he also mentioned that he wasn't afraid because he was armed. And then in the time since he's made speeches, he's become sort of a, um, an apologist of the insurrectionists. He calls the people that are detained political prisoners. He's made speeches about, gee, I wish I could, uh, allegedly, these are from the uh, petition, I wish I could bust them out. And uh, he's uh, talked about uh, the importance of the Second Amendment as a way, you know, it's uh, not for shooting uh, clay uh, pigeons, it's uh, it's uh, for preventing tyranny and people ought to be saving up their ammunition. And uh, so he's made uh, troubling uh, or provocative remarks. But I think when you compare it to some of the others, they, uh, they don't quite measure up. Now, of course, the thing under North Carolina is that, as I said, it's only reasonable suspicion or belief. And then you get discovery to try to prove that there's worse things out there. I guess one other thing that's mentioned, and it's just, uh, it's pretty thin, but it's interesting, is he worked for Mark Meadows uh, in 2015 to 2016. He was a staffer, and Mark Meadows was the immediate, uh, his immediate predecessor uh, for uh, the representative of the 11th uh, Congressional District. And, and Meadows was involved in that the call to Raffensperger, and and he too was an organi- allegedly organized with Stop the Steal. So there's sort of insinuation that uh, that makes matters worse, or or makes it more plausible to assume that Cawthorn might have known something, been involved. I should say, of course, that uh, uh, Cawthorn denies, uh, you know, any. Uh, encouragement of violence, and his his lawyer thinks this is completely absurd. The uh, the accusations are completely absurd. So we have a a particularly easy entree to court for plaintiffs. We have bad facts, but not terrible facts for Cawthorn in that he's definitely. Uh, said some supportive things. He's involved in the sort of stop the steal movement, but he's not, you know, urging anybody to storm the Capitol. He's not, uh, he may have had a gun or he said he was armed, but he's not storming the Capitol himself. So what do we know about what it takes to be engaged in insurrection for purposes of this provision of the Constitution? We do have some Section 3 cases from way back when. The the Supreme Court has never heard a Section 3 case, and so all of the precedents are over 100 years old. Most are 150 years old. But uh, we do have some precedents, including one from the Supreme Court of North Carolina, uh, as it turns out, and one from a circuit court, federal circuit court in North Carolina from that era. And uh, it sounds like you need more than just, usually you have needed more than just speech. You need to voluntarily assist, uh, try to uh, bring the uh, insurrection to a, well, what they say, a favorable termination, meaning favorable in terms of the insurrectionists. There are some cases, a couple cases, where pure speech seems to have sufficed. But I I would say the speech, in one case, the speech was worse. It was, you know, talking about that anyone who 
enlists in the Kentucky, uh, in Kentucky that enlists in the Union Army ought to be shot, that sort of thing. The other example is, is a fairly well-known one, but it, all of these come from before the modern era of First Amendment doctrine. So that casts a, a pall on them. There was one guy in 1919 that was blocked from taking office, taking his seat. He was elected to the House of Representatives, but he had he was a Austrian-born socialist, uh, Victor Berger, and he had uh, uh, opposed uh, the U.S. involvement in World War I. And he was actually indicted under the Espionage Act when he was uh, when he won election from Milwaukee, and then he was convicted. And then when he went to claim his seat, they blocked him, and they specifically said that he was disqualified under Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment. There's a lot of peculiarities about that case, but. It is pure speech, and and it sounds like it, it would be First Amendment protected speech in our uh, era. All right. So I am interested in what Cawthorn could argue or will argue in response. Obviously, he can argue, as you just described, that, hey, he wasn't doing anything other than speaking but he has antecedent arguments to that too. So what does Madison Cawthorn's response to the allegation that he is disqualified look like? So as I mentioned, you know, the immediate pressing thing is he wants to avoid having to submit to this discovery that he apparently would have to submit to under North Carolina law because of this very low bar uh, that the that the uh, apparatus sets up. And by the way, this is currently just at the state election board level. It would eventually, he would have an appeal to the state courts. But So what he's done is he's filed a federal suit to try to block that from going forward. And he cited a number of things. And of course, the fact that he he says he's not he, he didn't engage in insurrection, that's factual, and that would not be a basis for blocking the discovery provision. So he's made broader and legal objections at this point, and those are, uh, one, he's claimed that, and this is an, a surprising one, that the Amnesty Act of 1871, in which I can tell you more about, that, well, there was an Amnesty Act in 1871 that uh, a partial amnesty that lifted the Section 3 disability from a great many Confederates. He says that that actually applies prospectively, which is an unusual thing, and uh, that it would protect him. Uh, So that's one claim. A more mainstream claim is uh, his second argument, which is an important one. He says that the Congress has the exclusive power under the Constitution to sort of police the qualifications of its members. That's Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution. And he says that the North Carolina law uh, usurps the House's exclusive uh, uh, right to judge his qualifications. That is an argument that... uh, Derek Muller, a professor from Iowa Law School, University of Iowa, has uh, laid out in 2015 in a law review article. That's a very respectable argument. And so I, I and I think, frankly, that's his best argument. And it, and it could carry the day. So from your point of view, his best argument is not that Congress effectively repealed Section 3 of the 14th Amendment in 1871, rendered it a nullity effectively by with this amnesty law, but that Congress alone gets to decide the qualifications of its members. And if it considers him uh, disqualified under Section 3, the remedy is not to a North Carolina 
election board, but for Congress to refuse to seat him. Is that right? That's right. There are uh, responses to that argument and, and good responses. It is routine across the country for um, states and localities to uh, allow challenges to uh, people's uh, uh, basic qualifications for office before putting them on the ballot for, you know, for good reason. You don't want to have a whole election uh, be wasted because it turns out the guy was uh, 23 years old and he needs to be 25 years old. Also, uh, they also point to Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution that does give states the right over the, some, I think, the time, place, and manner uh, to set the time, place, and manner of elections, including uh, those of senators and, and uh, representatives. And the Supreme Court did decide a case, I think it's called Rauderbusch versus Hartke, in, in which it basically said that uh, that that was a case where uh, uh, Vance Hartke uh, had won a close election. Uh, Indiana was going to perform a routine recount. And he said, no, they can't do that because the exclusive control of, of my qualifications is uh, belongs to uh, the Senate. And um, the Supreme Court said, well, no, they can run their recount and the Senate will still have an independent judgment later. They can still, you know, if they decide, uh, they they can if the other guy wins, uh, they can refuse to seat him and say that you, and force uh, a new election. And so uh, somebody could say, uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure the the those people objecting to Cawthorn would say, after North Carolina makes its choice, the, the House will still ultimate have the ultimate ultimate decision later. I think that's a little attenuated because remember, we're at the primary stage. So if theoretically he were excluded from the primary ballot and some other Republican runs uh, and wins, then very few people in the House are going to have an incentive to refuse to seat him, even if they feel that uh, Cawthorn was wrongly uh, disqualified. On the other hand, There is something of a judicial history, albeit not a recent one, of ruling on disqualification issues and not deferring to Congress's authority, right? I mean, there's a there's a tremendous number of cases where these things are decided and not not objected to. And and of course, a lot of them involve just simple qualifications of habitancy and citizenship and things like that. There are two precedents that Cawthorn offers. The New Mexico Supreme Court, uh, it says, did uh, essentially rule the way he he says that they, uh, he, they felt the candidate could not be declared disqualified by the state authority. And then there's a district court judge from a uh, district court from uh, Louisiana. So uh, neither of those are binding in North Carolina. And, and of course, the uh, petitioners believe that both of those are distinguishable, but that really gets deep into the woods. So I, I don't think there's that, that much pertinent law out there. There was one case in which, actually, I don't mention this in the piece, but um, Justice Gorsuch, when he was um, a circuit judge, uh, did write a decision in which uh, he did allow uh, the local authorities to uh, make judgments about a federal candidate. But there the federal candidate was uh, the president. And of course, you don't run into Article 1, Section 5. Right. But I mean, there is a judicial history of court's ruling on Section 3 disqualification issues, right? So to the extent that that Cawthorn is arguing that courts really have no role in this because Congress has the exclusive authority, he's really arguing that a a whole era of disqualification cases post-Civil War were unconstitutional, right? No, No, I don't think so. Often... Uh, it would be Congress itself that would exclude somebody under Section 3 
And then a lot of the court cases involve state officials and special laws were passed that made it a crime for state officials to remain in office under this disqualification. And so you got cases that arose that are criminal cases for remaining in office, that sort of thing. Also, back then, people didn't have, you didn't have printed ballots. So uh, this never came up in the, in the context it's coming up here, where uh, you challenge at the ballot stage. I see. All right. So it seems to me that Cawthorn has one argument that is quite eccentric, which is that Congress effectively rendered Section 3 a nullity in 1871. Yeah. And then two arguments that are quite strong. One is that, as a matter of law, this isn't up to a court in North Carolina. It's up to Congress. And the second is, or a much less a district ballot election commission. And the second is that, you know, as a matter of fact, whatever he did, did, did not amount to insurrection within the meaning of the provision at all. I think that's right so far, but I also emphasize that that last one, because it's factual, uh, would not prevent him from getting deposed. And getting deposed and getting subpoenaed uh, is a big deal. He would be the first congressman to be forced to testify about January 6th. So you think the real risk to Cawthorn here is not that he will actually be disqualified, but that the burden will flip. He will have to prove that he did not engage in insurrection and that as part of that, he will have to testify under oath. I suspect so, yes. And that will hinge not on any question of fact, but purely on the question of law as to whether the court really has jurisdiction here at all. As, as to whether the election board has jurisdiction, yeah. Right, sorry. So what is the time frame? Like, there's not that much time until a primary in, you know, this year. Should we expect to see Madison Cawthorn deposed in the next few weeks or months? No, and but you're right. This is a, a huge uh, challenge in terms of timing. Here's what's happening. It's it's more complicated than that, is it? I mean, the day after he filed his petition, the petition was stayed by a state court because North Carolina, it's redistricting. He's now running in the 13th district because they redistricted, uh, was under challenge in the state for a gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering. And a few weeks ago, the North Carolina Supreme Court said, yes, this is an illegal gerrymander. We're, we're throwing out the redistricting. So the legislature has to submit a new map, map. I think it's due tomorrow. The primaries are set for May. So there's a lot that has to happen very quickly here. And uh, I think that that may also be in Cawthorn's favor. I, I, th I think the federal court might look for a way of getting rid of this case and the, the qualifications clause issue would give him a respectable off-ramp. So, because uh, if he doesn't, if this goes forward, there's a lot that has to take place very quickly. All right. So who are, one other matter, who are the people bringing this case? And is your perception that the goal is to get Madison Cawthorn off the ballot, or is the goal to establish a precedent by which they can get other people off ballots, or both? Well, it is being brought by a public interest group called Free Speech for People. Uh, it was founded 10 years ago. The lawyer is Ron Fine, the lead lawyer, and uh, he has some good people working with him. And this is bigger than North Carolina. This is, uh, he's got another, he's teamed up with another group called Our Revolution, and they are planning to bring other challenges uh, of, to others that uh, they, they uh, 
feel were disqualified. And I don't doubt that they believe that Cawthorn uh, was disqualified, but I, I also think that the discovery that they might be able to get would be very helpful all along to their objectives. They have also, a while back, they sent letters to all of the secretaries of states of the 50 states and of the District of Columbia. It's not a secretary of state there in D.C., but um, telling them uh, that uh, if Trump uh, runs again, he's disqualified under Section 3. So clearly they are committed. They, they, this is a long-term battle for this group. They have good lawyers, and uh, they've got two North Carolina Supreme Court justices involved in this, one from the Democratic Party, one from the Republican Party. They have the pro bono assistance of uh, Professor Gerard de Malioka, who's an expert, uh, a scholar on the Section 3 and the 14th Amendment. So um, it's a serious group. If you have additional questions for Roger on this subject, Roger will be uh, the guest on Lawfare Live uh, a week from today. That's Friday, February 25th at noon Eastern times, taking your questions on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, the Madison Cawthorn case, and what it could all mean. Roger, we are going to leave it there for now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer is the one and only Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Hey, folks, it is time for you to sign up to be a material supporter of Lawfare so you can ask your questions to Roger next week. Become a material supporter of Lawfare at our Patreon page www.patreon.com slash lawfare. The Lawfare podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yen. And as always, thanks for listening.